And we are live. Hello, everybody. This is Constance from Mysterious Galaxy. I want to say thank you so much to all the readers and readers slash authors that I'm already seeing in the comments. Mark, that is indeed a shout out to you. It's good to see your picture there. Um, but I am super, super excited because today we're ending the week on a fantastic YA note where we have Julie C. Bao here for The Broken Wish, and she is going to be in conversation with Don quick now what's really cool they're going to get to talk to you more about it but the broken wish is in a series where each book is written by a different author which is just such a cool concept and the first book dives into where if you have magic it's not so necessarily a friendly environment in which to have magic and of course we have a character who has magic and there are many things she discovers and that happens and what's good and what is bad things get questioned I'm going to go ahead and let our awesome authors talk to you more about everything. But the Vanna White section, as you guys are used to me calling it at this point, um, if you have any questions for our authors, I see you guys have already started asking questions, which is so beautiful. And if you have any more that arise, make sure where you see the ask a question down there. Click that and ask all of your questions for the authors. And also, I am a bookseller, and if you ask me the best way to celebrate a book is, why well, yes, to purchase said book. And if you would like to purchase this book as well as get a personalized book plate, which is pretty awesome sauce, there is a buy book and personalized book plate button down there. I am gonna stop gabbing now and let you hear what you're here to hear these authors talk about amazing books. And I will see you guys at the question section. Have a good discussion. Thanks, Constance. Yay. Oh no, I can't see your face anymore, but what? I hope everyone can see your face. I can hear you. I can see I can see both you and me. Okay. Weird. You'll probably come back in a couple. Okay. Can everyone see both of us? No, they can't see you. Oh, why not? I don't Hello. know. Maybe turn your camera off. Toggle and video. Off. Okay. Toggle Wait. video and then one second. And then okay. Can you see me now? No. Where's your cute face? Why oh, what? what? I hate it. It, sa it says my camera's working. What? Well, I don't understand. Um, let's check your camera and mic face visible. Yeah, right? We'll just give it another minute while Julie comes back. There you are. Perfect. <laughs> now we see your face. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hey, everyone. All right. So. <laughs> okay. Whew. You made it. You made it through your Broken Wish first week tour. You are here. Yeah. You are not cursed. We are <laughs> going to be talking a lot tonight about the fabulous book. And also, I'll be teasing out some things coming next as well. Um, oh. I know, because you're one of the very few people who have read my book in the series. So we're going to chat a little bit um it is amazing i'm gonna spoil everything in this chat tonight you should you guys should hit her cash app she'll tell you what what's in the book venmo. Um, I, I accept venmo oh yeah venmo we'll put the venmo detail <laughs> but first can you give everyone sort of a pitch for our series and for your book and sort of how it kicks it off because you are our start you start the race so Someone called me Michael Phelps yesterday because they were comparing our series to a relay race. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not Michael Phelps. I'm that granny who swims at the rackets, like the, the planet fitness pool, you yeah. know, like you, you're, I think you're the Michael Phelps. Get it done. Like, this was a, like we were running. I'm going to be Usain Bolt. I'm the second one that comes. There we go. Okay. Exactly. What, is, what does he do? He does that, that bolt thing yeah. with his hands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. okay um, well, this is the book, you guys. This is the book. It came last week, I think, and it's so gorgeous. And Broken Wish is the first book in a four book series that's going to be all authored by different people. So obviously, I'm writing the first one. Ms. Danielle Clayton is writing the second book. JC Cervantes is writing the third book. And LL McKinney is writing the fourth and final book. So this is a really great roundup of powerful women writers, and we're ready to kick this off. So Broken Wish deals with the ancestors of this family tree. So if you open up the hardcover, 
you will see these two family trees for these characters that are in our book. And the four book series deals with different generations of the same family. So Broken Wish kicks it off in 1800s Hanau, Germany, which is a real place. It's the birthplace of the Brothers Grimm, actually, the OGs of fairy tale storytelling in the Western world. Um, and it starts with 16-year-old Elva. She's my main character. And she discovers that she has this strange forbidden magic, and she doesn't know where it comes from. All she knows is that anytime she looks into a mirror, any reflective surface, like a puddle of water, she can see glimpses of what is to come and what she sees always comes to pass. So when she sees this devastating tragedy that's headed toward her family and everything that they've worked for, she has to go find someone to help her. And who better than the infamous witch of the North Woods who lives in this dark forest nearby and is reputed to have these powerful magical um, gifts and she hopes that this woman can help her protect her family and it's going to kick off a series where each of the books is set in a different time period and a different setting and Danielle is going to be writing about Elva's descendants right Danielle? I am and <clears throat> without spoiling just know that my book comes quite a bit after Julie's book um, and I'm not going to tell you how my protagonist named Zora, how she relates to Julie's characters, but there is a direct link and it's very cool. You find out in like the first chapter. So, um, <laughs> but it's still like a nice, like, I don't want to ruin it. But what I love is that Julie really set up the magic. She really set up this family and then all of us branch out from there and everything just gets tangled and complicated as things do. So it's just been really fun to, to do that. And so I want us to dive into the world because we are writing in a shared world together. Right. It's just a couple of, it's just years apart from each other. And so I want you to talk about the world of this novel and the types of magic we're going to find there. And then I can add in like what, how some of that might have morphed and changed over time for my book. Sure. Well, this was my first foray into historical fantasy because I'm writing about a real actual place where people live today. I think someone tweeted me the other day and said, why did why did you set your book in my town? Like, I live here. And I had to explain that, well, it's the birthplace of the Brothers Grimm. That's why we decided, because this is a dark fairy tale, we wanted to carry on that tradition of creepy old fairy tale stories. And, you know, having that hanging over me was a big responsibility because I had to do my research. I had to um, have respect for, for people's actual home. And so I did a lot of research about what Hanau, Germany might have been like back in the 1800s. I had to look at the geography of the place to make sure that my story would fit around um, what was actually there because there's this big forest, which I took liberties with. The forest doesn't exist. I made it up. But I had to make sure that the river was there, that the town, the outskirts of the town were elsewhere lives on it is pretty accurate and authentic because it's always good to center your fictional story in when you're writing about a real place it's good to center it in a place in a way that feels authentic um and the world building was just a joy from there because the north woods i felt like i could take some liberties with it because it had come right out of my head and i just made up this place where people who have been ostracized for their magic went to hide and so all of this magical energy lingers in the forest so there's pockets out of time there's like different dimensions there's these weird uh, landmarks that pop up and disappear like wishing wells and it was just really really fun to write about all these fairy tale tropes that we all know and love but put a new unique spin on it and um the magic in my world i wanted to have two different types of magic the physical magic which is telekinesis you can make things move you can make flowers spring out of thin air and then there's a less tangible magic a sort of unreliable magic that deals with human nature like promises because the big crux of the story and the reason why this family curse comes about not to spoil it too much but it deals with a promise that gets broken and in my world the magic of a promise is when that vow gets shattered it releases this energy into the universe and it invites consequences onto you and you do not know what consequences they will be and no one can control what they are and what intensity they come in so that is the basis of the magic that i've built i wanted to have costs because i 
think there's a lot better stakes in a story where the magic that you use has costs. It, it takes something away from you and you might not necessarily know what it is. And Danielle has written about this very beautifully. She's taken the themes that I've set out and completely evolved them to fit her timeline. And that's what I love so much about this series and the challenge of it is that Julie set up this beautiful magic that has both parts and is deep and feels like almost like you use it and you're almost wounded too by it. And then it, she hands it off to me and my it translates into 1928 New Orleans. And so all of the stuff that's going on in the 20s, so all that jazz, but we're in the Jim Crow South and we're in New Orleans, right? And so, and when we're some different looking kinds of people. And so the magic translates <laughs> in a very particular way. So the telekinesis, the, you know, the disguise, there's lots of different um, things that happen that are translated into, into my book um, and morph. And I, it was just a treat because Julie's book really functions, functions as our like Bible <laughs> or mine, where I've read Broken Wish probably about five times cover to cover because I wanted to make sure that any threads and characters that might be in Julie's book show up wonderfully and beautifully affirmed in my book. So, you do it so cleverly too. I read Danielle's manuscript, you guys. This was a couple of drafts back, right, Danielle? You've it you've said it. it was I, fresh. It was so good. Shut up. It was so good. Yeah. I read it and I was like, oh, I see what she did there. Like she took this element from my book. She took this relic, because not to spoil it or anything, but there are a lot of magical artifacts that get passed down in addition to magic. Mm -hmm. And the way that they they twist and they morph with the time period to make it more fitting for her character, like it's genius. It's absolutely wonderful. But, and what was so great is that we get, we have four like badass, excuse my language, ladies, like with all of our magical, like love of magic, working on these four books. And so we found really clever ways to tie everything together. And so that was like a lot of fun because each one of us has our own particular sandbox that we're playing in, but we're threading through to each other and making a tapestry so that the whole series feels connected. Exactly. And it feels like a treasure hunt. We're, we're hoping that readers will read each book and see little Easter eggs in each subsequent book where there's clues of, of maybe even, you know, familiar faces or familiar themes and items. So it's going to be a really fun and interesting read, I think. I've never read a series quite like this, so no. I'm excited to see how it turns out. Me too. I can't wait. And I love everyone's different time periods and and books. And I love that they are connected yet separate. And so you should read them in order. But like, it's interesting so that you can put and find all the Easter eggs. And if you read them a second time, then you'll see our little breadcrumbs that we left behind for you all. Right. Um, why? I mean, when we, we both got asked to come into this big world, and you were the only other author I knew. And so I felt safe saying, yes, I'll do it because I knew that you, queen of fairy tales, was going to set us off in the right direction. Why do you like fairy tales? What? Because your first book is one of my favorites, A Force of a Thousand Lanterns. It's deeply dark and decadent and gorgeous. And we have a character who is not always nice. Um, and I love her for it because it's real. And I want to know what draws you into the dark. Why do you like that? I love fairy tales because they feel familiar. They feel comforting. They feel like a bedtime story told to you, or they feel like sitting by a fireplace at night and having this tale we woven in front of you. And the fact that so many people in the Western world know the same fairy tales, have been raised with the same fairy tales, I think that's something really unique that binds us all together. Even people who don't read a lot, like they generally know how Cinderella goes, they know how Snow White goes. Um, and so I think that having that that sandbox to play in to use your analogy that you just used. Um, I think it's really fun because you, you 
sort of lure the reader in with a sense of security, with a sense of comfort, like, oh, this feels familiar. I know this story. There's a witch, there's a magic mirror, there's red dancing shoes, there's a wishing well. But then you flip the tropes on their head and you can do something beautiful and unique. And I was speaking about this last night with uh, my friend, Anna Marie Mecklemore, who was my love, conversation partner. She, they, they, are, they are absolutely amazing. And like just, you know, talking to them about how fairy tales can be completely different animals when a, a person of color tells them, you know, because we put a unique spin on it, a unique nuance that has never been done before. And so that was a really co interesting conversation that I had. But yeah, that's that's basically why I love fairy tales because there's so much room to move on from what is on the page because everything's so flat. The characters either all good or all bad. Mm -hmm. And there's so many questions like, why does the evil stepmother want to kill her exactly? Where does the stepmother come from? Um, where does the witch come from? Why is she evil? What are the bruises that this person holds within them to make them this way? So that's basically why I enjoy fairy tales. Why do you enjoy fairy tales? Because the, the Bells is not specifically a fairy tale reimagining, but you get a lot of those familiar tropes too. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, Brittany, our mirror mom, uh, came to me and was like, <laughs> you have to do this because um, I'm really fascinated with fairy tale tropes as skeletons to dig into um, or scaffolding to dig into like the dark sides of human nature. And I think that they've lasted the test of time because they're used in ways to teach lessons. However, what's interesting is that all of those things seem to come down hard on women, whether they're older women and they're the witch, whether they are, they didn't have children. So they're the stepmom and they like marry a man who has children. Like, there's all of these things that bring the hammer down on women in a very particular way. And your book really digs into that. And that's why I love what you've taken all of these things that people think they know. A lot of people are going to enter our series and think they know what we're going to do. And then we flip it on them. Exactly. Um, and so I want you to talk about too, sort of how you took, you really do talk and show a lot of the misogyny, a lot of the fear mongering around powerful women. I want you to talk about that um, yeah. a lot. Um, yeah. from what you in Broken Witch. Sure. Well, the original fairy tales were written by men. They were told by men. And so oftentimes you see those stories positioning a woman who is older, as you say, as the villain. Because, you know, when a girl is young in a fairy tale and beautiful, she's desirable. Men want her. The prince wants her. Everyone wants to protect her. The witch is jealous of her. But then when she gets married and then she ages past a certain threshold, she either becomes invisible, like the fairy godmother in Cinderella, where she's just there to serve the main character's purpose she has no inner life she has no backstory to herself she's either invisible or if she refuses to be invisible and she wants to be powerful and she wants to reclaim something of her youth then she's evil she's the evil queen she's the wicked stepmother um and i wanted to play with that theme in my fairy tale because it's so prevalent in in the brothers Grimm's works um the woman always being pointed at and and being mm -hmm. hated and i wanted to position the character Matilda who is the witch in my book and explore exactly what went into making her character why does she feel that the world hates her and what would that do to a person what would that do to someone who feels like she's not welcome here she has to remove herself from the world and um, people I, I was talking about this with Anna Marie last night as well it feels as though magic wielders in my world are like people of color carrying our mm -hmm. family's heritage is carrying the weight of of being useful of being wanted only when we're useful and then when we're not wanted when we're not useful we're hated we're ostracized for for what we are what we have um and i wanted to play with that trope with the character of matilda because it's it's so important to me to play with the theme of misogyny which is so um poisonous and toxic in these stories and I love Matilda so much. And you'll find out more reasons of why I love Matilda in my book. But <laughs> you say that Matilda's an angry character from what has happened to her? 
She's furious. I think she's furious. Um, she she has just been hated and pushed aside and betrayed so many times. And there's a big betrayal awaiting her at the beginning of Broken Wish. Not to spoil too much, but, you know, people let her down time and time again. And she's the kind of person who wants to open her heart. She tries to open up to friends, to, to lovers even. She's been in love once and she just gets let down every time because people can't accept her for who she is. And I would say, you know, that her anger might be a gift, you know, I would definitely say that her anger is a gift. Mm -hmm. I would say so. I would say so. And I think that that carries through her descendants. That was for Marcus Sherrill. And I know Mark is probably pissed. But <laughs> <laughs> that was just for Mark. Um, but it's true. But it's true. <laughs> it's true. Though. It's with Matilda. Matilda's like, we love you, Mark. I know we love you, Mark. Matilda's probably my favorite character um, and a little bit of my heart. And so you set up Matilda in such a wonderful, beautiful way in your book that I wanted to honor her and make sure um, that she was honored in my book in a particular way that I had to sort of fight <laughs> to put <laughs> her in when we were outlining and such. Um, right because I just felt it to be super important. Um, and you did so much great work at humanizing this idea of the witch in the woods and what we think about that woman and how we view them. Um, so I just, I just love it. Um, Thank you, you for saying that. I, I think you did a great job upholding Matilda's legacy in Shattered Midnight. And I think that Zora, I love her anger. She's an angry character too. Can you tease oh, yeah. any, any more about her and your book? Sure, yes. So obviously we are a, a lot, we were away from those woods um, in Germany. And um, Matilda is, I mean, um, Zora is very angry. And this book is definitely about processing anger and processing sort of persecution in the way that it echoes what Matilda's dealing with and also sort of what it means to like be wailing all of the time and what that might look like when your magic manifests, when the world presses down upon you and makes you feel like you can't express yourself because expressing yourself as a black woman in 1928, Jim Crow South means that you can go to jail or you can die. And right. so her magic comes out in a very just angry and rageful way um, because she has to process it. And right. I'm just, excited to write strong women and strong girls who aren't afraid um, sometimes to like let it all out because I do right. think that we receive programming that means that we swallow absolutely swallow the upset and the anger in order to be likable absolutely and for people to accept us and I just want teen girls who read our books teen Anybody, all the people who read our books to just be like, no, I'm allowed to say when I'm upset. Yes. I'm allowed to express myself and people have to deal with it. And exactly. Well I said. Our, yeah, I think that our books and our series, because Jen has some of this and you know Elle McKinney will have a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. It's going to be so furious. I know. Where it's just like these furious girls. Yeah. And I just think the more we do it, the better, because it gives license and it tells them that it's okay because I wasn't told it was okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My household, I was not allowed to express emotions as a girl. Right. My brothers were allowed to kick and fight and be angry because they were boys who were going to become mm -hmm. men. And right. I wasn't allowed to be sad. I wasn't allowed to be angry or express myself. So writing books like this normalizes that for girls. It's right. normal to have these human emotions. It's okay to tell people that you're not okay. Right. And I don't always have to be pleasant. Matilda right. is not always pleasant. No. It's not always pleasant. It's That's okay right. to be not happy and not nice right. all the time. And the more we can say, like, it's okay to have that, that you don't have to be agreeable or bend yourself into shapes in order to fit society. That's what I love about these books as well. The society and the time period of each one of our books really yeah. squeezes our characters. Yeah. Yeah. To break them. It's interesting that all these books are set in such tumultuous times 
because mm-hmm. your book is is in 1920s New Orleans. Jen Cervantes' book is in 1960s San Francisco. So a lot right. of upheaval there. And then Elle McKinney's is in modern day New York City. So there's there's right. always a lot going on that's pressing in on our characters and challenging them from the outside while on the inside, they're struggling with this family heritage, with this curse that's mm-hmm. been following them through the ages. And then magic, right? And what happens yes. when you put magic in a pressure cooker Right. <laughs> well, <dad. laughs> right? You get some angry home. girls exploding. Exactly. And I just, it's just been like such a wonderful treat to, to be able to explore these emotions because I don't know what kind of teen reader you were. Let's get into it. And sort of how we leave breadcrumbs of ourselves behind in our characters. I think I'm writing a character that I wish I was versus the teen that I was when I read my journals, which was a little bit more afraid. Um, So I want to know what you left behind of smaller, younger, juicy Dow. Like who was left behind? Were your breadcrumbs? Small Julie Dow. I don't know if you guys can see it, but I have like a whole row. This shelf right here has all of my journals. So I I have been keeping daily diaries since I was 10 years old. I am now 35, so it's been 25 years of of journals, and they are so angry, Danielle. Uh, All of my journals. I was like the nice, nice, sweet little straight A student who never talked back to anyone, who always followed directions, followed instructions. But in my journals, I let it all out. And I'm starting to realize now that by writing these characters, like writing Shifeng in Forest of a Thousand Lanterns, my evil queen character, people who aren't afraid to be ambitious, people who aren't afraid to be like, no. I'm going to fight you because I don't like what you're saying to me. I don't like that you're treating me badly. And that was something I could never say. That's something that I still have trouble saying. I still have trouble standing up for myself today. So I feel that I'm the same as you. I'm putting these breadcrumbs of small, angry Julie who could never express herself fully into these characters who are, who aren't afraid to do that. I can't wait for us to see when the world recovers these people in our line, these teens in our line being like, thank you. Like, thank you for giving me a story where I could work some of this stuff out because I believe that books and stories helped me work out things that were happening to me. And that's why I wanted to be a writer to give that gift of story so that kids who look like us could have a space Absolutely. To be like, I hate it. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right, I hate it all. I want to absolutely. Well, fiction is such a great way of taking these less palatable aspects of human nature, these these crises that we're dealing with in the world, and interpersonal problems as well, and presenting them in a way that not only makes you feel less alone, but also entertains at the same time. Like you're you're connecting with these characters. You're realizing that what you're feeling is not specific to you. It's okay to feel those things and see this character working this out in, in this story. That means that you, there's hope for you too. And the fairy tale lens, I think, helps us and allows us to go dark. Right. We're allowed to, because I think that when we think about fairy tales, there are a different set of rules. We're allowed to go to that ego, that, you know, id, like that that basic part of human nature and just sort of like let it all out, right. um, which is what is so exciting about this series. First, it's like we've got all of these powerhouses with all of that imagination, and then we get to go dark. Um yes which is so much fun and we get to do magic and we get to build this out, this whole thing. And I was a kid that would have devoured this series. Me too. Me too. Because I love fairy tales, tales, Easter eggs, historical, um, strong female characters. Like I was there for it. Me too. Me too. Yeah. Fractured fairy tales were always my thing. I loved reimaginings. I loved retellings. Did you ever watch that cartoon Rocky and Bullwinkle? Yeah. Has, has anyone seen that cartoon? I feel like they didn't they have like little snippets of fractured fairy tales sometimes. Mm-hmm. I ate those up. I devoured them because they were so much fun because they were stories that I knew, but they were twisting them. And I, I wonder if that was part of my origin story as a writer. I feel like probably because you do this so well and I think that Thank that's you. one of the reasons why you are our lead. You're the first one <laughs> at the gate because this is something you've done deftly in your other in your other work. And I feel like you set up such the stakes are high, friends. 
oh, your heart's going to be broken by this book. Be, don't like you're going to get to the end. You're going to be like, Julie Dow, and you're gonna <laughs> um, you're too kind. I had the easy part of this job as we were talking about at our launch party at Books of Wonder on Tuesday night because you guys. So the most important part of the relay race is always the two people in the middle, right? Well, everyone's important, but the two people in the middle, like you guys, gotta gotta keep that race running because you know once you have that baton, you can't let up or the other team's gonna catch up. So the fact that you wrote the second book and right out of the gate, I read your early draft. I thought it was such a powerful um, reworking of all the themes that were in my book. Like, I think that this is going to be one relay race that's going to be really, really fun to watch as it approaches the finish line. I know. I can't wait to read them start to finish. Me like, too. The whole set Me of too. them yeah. to like, see how everyone did that stitching. Exactly. And what's the fun part. And like, let's talk about writing. We're all such different writers and we have different processes. And so I want to know, like, if we are... At, in your office, like watching you write, if you had your own reality TV show, <laughs> oh, you might want to see like what is your process and how did you how did you approach this? Because yeah. you know we were brought in to do a very particular thing. Exactly. So. Yeah, exactly. So it was a really unique structure. I've, you know, I've always written original stories and mm -hmm. the ideas come from me. Everything comes from me. But here we we had a light structure to work with, which was really fun mm -hmm. because it was like, here's point A, here's point B, here's point C. It was very generalized, very bare bones. And it was our job to connect the dots into a coherent flowing story that made sense and that had parts of us in them too, right? That's the great thing about this Disney series is Disney gave us so much room to bring our own nuances, bring our own experiences and our own twists on these stories. Um, so I had never done anything like that before. So I'm a huge plotter. I okay. sat down, I plotted out each chapter, basically just three to four sentences, not anything extensive, because I always know that my outlines change. They always evolve, no matter how much I try to control them, being the type A organized control freak that I am. I they love always it. end up changing. I hate it. I hate it. I, I hate being it. a Virgo. I hate <laughs> being a Virgo. My mom's a Virgo, um, my brother's a Virgo, my grandparents are Virgos. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I just like to have a roadmap and I don't know if you would agree with that, but I love having, I compare it to having a flashlight because when you start out writing a book, you're, you're in a dark hallway and you can't really see much in front of you. You can see only the immediate steps and having that faint outline is like having a flashlight to help guide my way. So what about you? How do you generally start a book? So I'm sort of in the middle. There's the pantsers who fly by the seat of their pants. That gives me anxiety. I can't do that. Same. But my outlines, I am a monster, and I never know the way my books end. But for this, I knew what I had to because I have to pass the baton right. to Cervantes. So I had to stick my landing, and I was like, <laughs> oh, God, this is where I've got to go. So I call myself a headlights writer. I can only see about six feet in front of me, so six chapters at a time. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I was like, okay, I know I have to land here. Let me start here, and I would do six chapters, and I'd read them, and I'd be like, okay, six more. And because we had those little tent poles along the way that we had yep. to hit so that all the other books worked, I just tried to stitch them together in interesting ways to get to those big, maybe they're like lighthouses. Mm -hmm. I had to sort of get there. Um, but it was very stressful, very, very stressful for me because <laughs> I – Knew I had to land somewhere, and I've never written a book where I knew the ending already. Right. So I was like, oh, no. And I thought it would kill my creativity, but it actually made me feel safe. So I'm oh, going nice. to start trying to know my ending. This is the Victoria Schwab method. She yells at me all the time about this. She's like, you need to know your ending. I know my ending. I went backwards. You have to earn it. And so she's always squawking at me about it. And now I, I get it. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> You're like, no. oh where the ship is going because I've never I've never done that before. So it was really cool and people need to know that we got to chat with each other, which was the best thing about this whole thing is that I wasn't alone. Writing right. books is such a solitary experience. But right. with this, I could complain, I could text you and be like, oh, what do I do? This, the magic is getting unwieldy, how do I fix it? And then you guys put your brains to work and they had to fix my magic. When I was halfway through my draft because I was like, uh-oh, there's a hole here. 
and I don't know how to fix it. And so it was great. I had my own little like little rescue rafts in <laughs> hell. Where you're, you're giving us too much credit because you figured out most of the stuff yourself. It's just the 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 fact that you can bounce ideas off of people. I think that sometimes like I'll get on the phone with one of my friends, like Tochi Onyebuchi is one of my yeah. best friends. Like if I have a plot issue, I will call him up and be like, just listen to me. And I'll just talk. I'll just talk through and then I'll be like, oh I figured it out. Never mind. Okay, bye. <laughs> don't bother asking him how he is but yeah know, it's, it's just, yeah he is but it's just like having someone to to bounce ideas off of and i feel that the four of us were collaborating in that way and we have this monster group text on my phone that's like <laughs> thousands of texts long and it's mostly like me despairing and you guys are like no you're fine and then you're like i broke the family tree we're like no you didn't you didn't I know. <laughs> That's, and it's so true. Everyone who's listening, it's so true. Like literally we toggle back and forth through existential dread of, and like, oh, this is, <laughs> oh no, this is so bad. Or like, oh, I broke it. And so, and because we are a unit, we right. are a unit. Our books function together. We have, to, we have to thread it. And so that's what's so exciting about this whole thing. And so bef before I move to questions, before we move to questions from the audience, I have another like, Final big question for us to consider. Okay. First of all, I mean, because you've talked about you not being able to survive fairy tales <laughs> <laughs> yourself, but um, is there a fairy tale that you would love to complicate or remix or write in the future that you feel like benefits from some more analysis or like to like chew on? Because I do think that some fairy tales get more play than others. And I'm wondering Agreed. if there's one that you would love to chew on. Agreed. Well, I, I always say Hansel and Gretel when people ask me this, this question, because that's something I've always wanted to explore, the witch in her candy house. But I was also just talking about this last night, the little mermaid, the original little mermaid. I love that ending. It is so tragic and angsty where the mermaid doesn't get her man and he loves another woman. And it's just so sad. Like I would it's love, depressing. it's so depressing, but I love it. Danielle, you know me. I love I dark, do. unhappy I stuff. And if you wrote this book, I would be devastated and my heart would be bleeding. And I went to, I went to see his house. I went to Denmark Did in you? Copenhagen and there's this big little mermaid statue. And I went to see where he worked and lived oh, cool. and saw all of those things. And, it in a post COVID world when we recover, it is worth a trip to go see the origin of his dark fairy tales as a fairy tale lover. I'm um, adding that to my list because okay, mm -hmm. so so your book is in New Orleans and you went to New Orleans to do research. Jen Cervantes's book is in San Francisco and she went to San Francisco to do research. I'm like, where's my trip to Germany, guys? Look, Who's I'm happy to take this on the road once <laughs> I get Look, let's open. visit the locations. Let's visit yes. all the locations in our books. Let's do it. Yes. Yes. Post COVID. What what about you? What fairy tale would you like to remix? I actually there's one, there's a few French fairy tales that um are dark. Uh like Bluebeard. Oh yeah. Bluebeard, the nine wives guy. The nine wives guy. <laughs> I would want to sort of take that and sort of pull it through a lens of both yes. race and class. Um, I'm, I'm envisioning you doing some kind of Mexican Gothic mm -hmm. thing. That book was amazing. Like some yeah. kind of exploration about white exoticism mm -hmm. of women of color and yeah. black women. And exactly. I think you could do that really, really well. And I would read it. I would buy it immediately. Yeah. I'm here for the dark stuff. I mean, that's what draws me to the fairy tales. And that's what I love about Hans Christian Andersen and going, that's why I went to, to, to research and to see his house, because I thought, what is he exposing? What are these fairy tales exposing about right. us and that right. sort of darkness? And, um, and that's the other reason why I went to New Orleans, because there is such a, everybody sees New Orleans as the veneer of it, the beignets, carnival, the big brass music, the uh, second lines, but they don't know the underbelly. And I wanted to show, make sure that that was included and not clean that up because I think that's where 
where the really good stuff is. And that's where you went in in the dark wood. And I felt like readers loving Broken Wish and the dark wood and Matilda really deserve to also see that the dark wood has sort of carried itself. There are dark woods in other places. That's right. um, And that it echoes. And so... That's right. I'm sensing a theme with us. Maybe this is why we're such good friends. And maybe this is why Disney asked us to write the first two books. We're like, we don't shy away from the darkness. We don't shy away from the unsavory. Exactly. And complicated. And I think that what you do so well and what what you're showcasing in this book is that Elva and Matilda are very complicated. And they're allowed to do that. And you give them the, they're not perfect people. And you give them that space. And you complicate what we think we know about these fairy tales and what we think we know about this world and yeah and you flip it and i love it and so yeah i'm just so thrilled that you know we get to we get to go to the darkness together (laughs) yes and 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 we're gonna bring the readers with us exactly come into into our dark woods come into the seedy part of new orleans exactly and so the the dark north wood it's just like the dark of New Orleans and they just parallel. And I think that it's a beautiful sort of way to stitch everything together. And so now we're going to take some questions because we have quite a few. And yeah. I think Constance is going to come back on and join us in a second, hopefully. But in the meantime, while we're waiting for her to come back on, I want to know what your favorite magical object is. If you could have a magical object right now in your house. What's it going to be? You want to get one from the book? Magic mirror. Okay. I have a magic mirror in my office. You know, I just look into it every once in a while and I ask, when when am I going to write the next bestseller? I know. You do the mirror. I'd actually, so Julie, you'll see in this book, there are some shoes that are quite particular. Yes. And I want the shoes. You you would definitely have the shoes. Being the author of Tiny Pretty Things and and you know all the ballet, like of course you would pick the beautiful dancing shoes. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> How could you resist? I'm a sucker for shoes too, so I think I would probably end up picking shoes as well. And I just want to say before we dive into the questions too, I love how you guys are talking about the like beauty and the darkness of fairy tales because I feel like especially for my generation and kind of the generations around it. Like I just turned 30 this year, the Disney fairy tales and all the like, very like happy, but then you start to discover the origin fairy tales, of a lot of these, and you're like, Ooh, they were dark. And what's beautiful is now they're being retold in a different way. And they're dark in a very different way than how they were originally. And I just, Ooh, I love all the feels. And like, when you mentioned the little mermaid, I was like, Yeah, the prince was abusive and made her sit on a cushion outside of his door while he was hanging out with other women. Let us not forget that part of the story. So I was just, I was like, yeah, we we forget how gnarly those stories start out sometimes. Um, and mm -hmm, And it made me think too, like, I don't know about you guys, but Maleficent, beautiful, strong, I'm gonna say what you said, Danielle. Badass, and she was a villain. But was she a villain just because she was stronger than everyone, and she didn't take sass from anyone else? Oh, I, don't, I would I don't probably not look at that. I would too. I would too. There was a reason she was my favorite. <laughs> so the first question. These questions are gonna tie in a little bit with some of the things you've already been talking about. So I'm gonna edit them, tweak them a little bit. Okay. Um, but the most popular one that we had is because this is a four part series. How collaborative is the writing effort between you four authors? I imagine with the different time periods and narratives, there wasn't a great deal of overlap. You definitely touched on how you guys have your texting and everything and how you've communicated, but with actually tying, so maybe we can focus on this. How was it tying all of the plot lines together for you guys? And how is it to kind of connect all of them in that aspect? Danielle, do you want to speak on this? Since you have to pick up the baton from me. Right, so so Julie's book sort of set out the the chronology. I can never say that word correctly. And I had to pull a thread all the way through and complicate it and add my characters onto the thread and then Jen adds her characters onto my thread and so on and so forth and it unravels and keeps going. Um, and what happened was that we made these documents track. 
that was one of the biggest things we did, which is brilliant. Um, track your thoughts if we're going to do a wonky sort of thing. And then also, I would make sure that I knew. Does everyone hear that squeaking? Yeah. Is, is, Constance, is that coming from your end? It might. Let me see. If I do that, there's, is that. There's a lot of noise. How Maybe. about Danielle? While you finish answering, I'm gonna go grab some headphones to see if that'll help. Okay, with do it you want to move? Okay, so, so, okay, perfect. Let's see. Yeah, that that sounds better already. So Danielle, okay. you were saying you take the threads from my story and you make sure right. that they continue on. That they continue on. And so one of the yeah. big things I did was I created a lexicon of terms that Julie used in her book. So the way she defined magic, the way the powers that were exhibited. Um, and the magical objects and what they do. And right. so I created a little like cheat sheet for myself and copied and pasted like language so that I knew exactly so that it would echo. And so, and then our mirror mom, Britt, <laughs> would make sure she'd be the overarching and it's like, okay, this is what Julie set up. And then here's how it echoes in my book and then how I've complicated it. And then that way Jen has hers to keep right. moving forward because right. I really felt like in order for to create that internal consistency of our world building, I felt like it was important to make sure that it was sharp. So it was a lot of fun. I found that to be a lot of fun um, doing that. It's brilliant. It's like a game almost mm -hmm. where I set down the first domino and you have to make sure that your domino lines up exactly next to mine. Mm -hmm. And in the writing of my manuscript as well, I shared a lot of my world building and my magic system with you guys just to make sure that I wasn't messing anything up because you were saying how much pressure it was to, to write in this new style that we had never written in before. Mm -hmm. And I was pretty much pressured by being the first book out out of the gate and coming ahead of Queen Danielle Clayton. I'm like, mm -hmm. I can't mess this up. Like I have to set it up so, so well. I just have to not mess it up. And so- the Lies, you see these lies, you hear these lies that she tells. <laughs> He's the one who said fairy tales, I've never done this before. The <laughs> well, it feels that way. Every time I start a new book, I'm like, how do I do this? How did I write books before? You know, know. do you ever feel that? Oh, I feel the same when way. Start I I'm like, I'm trash. This is yeah. terrible. <laughs> Who told me I could do this? Who's lying now? Right. And then I'm like, and then it gets like, first one is like, oh, this is bad. And then I'm like, okay, I rewrite it. And I'm like, okay, there might be a few things here. Keep this is not so bad. And then your editor tells you, this is good. we got to clean up a little bit. But this is good. And so that's right. the process of making a book. It's like, oh no, that blank page is scary. Every time. Exactly. I thought it was going to get easier. I know it it's, doesn't. It's actually. I, I've heard it gets harder because the better of a writer you become, the more critical you are of yourself. So can't can't wait. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. We lost your face again. What? Oh no! You, Whose face you, did we lose? You Maybe can't see my. Lost. You can't see my face. Can, can you everyone, see? Me? Can everyone see? I, I can see everybody's face and hear okay. everyone. Yeah, I can see and hear all of you too. Okay, what perfect. about you guys? Oh, okay. Everyone says we can. I can also, see everyone. Also, did these guys? Did these help out with the noise? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Those awesome. are good. Just like a kickback. You didn't know this was going to be like a Bo's feature, did you? No. Yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. So the next question we have is: the two of you know each other. Um, do you know the other two authors well? And I don't know, but based off of the love in the comments, it seems like there is great camaraderie and love between. I mean, all of you. And they said, uh, were you looking for people who write in a particular style when this project was being put together? Well, we didn't, we didn't have that people, kind of right? Power. Yeah. <laughs> when, when I signed on, I didn't know who the other authors were. I had no idea when I signed on. And then someone told me, but I had a feeling, Danielle, that you would be writing the second book for some reason because New Orleans, the jazz age, flappers, opulence. I was like, wait a second, what what does that sound like? Who would who would knock that out of the park? And then it turned out to be you. I think Brit, I like harassed Brit into telling Brit's our editor, you guys, Brit Rubiano. She's fantastic. Uh, I harassed mom. her. Yeah. <laughs> I got I got my agent to ask her. I'm like, figure out who it is. And she said it was Danielle Clayton. I'm like, perfect. I made the right choice. And she, so I harassed, I harassed her about who's going first. Who's going uh, first? Who's, 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 
starting it, I was like, like they have some fairy Julie tale. Out. And I was like, Julie, I was like, yes, we got this. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and I knew it. And then Jen, um, because Jen and I are Disney authors, I figured I was like, there's going to be another Disney author in here too. And I was just like nosing around to see. And it was like so great. And then LL McKinney coming in, I was like, all right, another one. She wrote <laughs> one of my favorite books of 2018, A Blade So Black. I ate that thing up like candy. It was yep. so good. So Thank good. You. I've never seen Alice in Wonderland reimagined like that. So when I saw that she was the fourth author, I'm like, bam, this is like a roundup for the ages. It's so yeah. good. Yep. It's a ridiculously awesome roundup of authors. As like a reader, I have to say it's very exciting to see like all four of you in it. And I like this and this kind of ties in um, how you're talking about the like the location and time settings. But how were the various locations and time periods chosen? Did you guys pick them? Were you given them? How was that kind of brought about? I was given mine, Danielle. You were you were given yours as well. Oh, yeah, I think I think Britt chose Britt and Karen, our editors, chose the time periods and settings. But I, I imagine they chose them because of the tumultuous nature of those eras, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think Brittany really thought about what were points of crisis um, in sort of globally and in you know, primarily in America, but we have the yeah. immigrant um, story too, because you'll find out sort of right. how we get to the shores of America from Hanau, Germany. Exactly. In my book. Um, so it is points of chaos and crisis and how a curse can compound within points of points of chaos. <laughs> yeah. well, I love what you said about the pressure cooker, about how... Yeah magic in a pressure cooker you're gonna get an explosion you're just asking for yes. it to yeah. yes it's like all the ingredients for a, for a big explosion and that's what we want in series right danielle we want we want explosiveness we don't want something that readers have seen before we right. want something that's teetering on the edge of of unease mm -hmm. uh, something something big is about to come and you guys will be surprised by what um, happens in Julie's book and then where we take it and how it just and how those echoes keep twisting and snowballing and basically going to hell because it's going to get bad. <laughs> As a reader, my heart is so happy hearing that. I'm just bring on the pain and the chaos You're gonna be and mad the horrible Julie. magic. You're gonna be mad at Julie after this book, and then you're gonna be mad at me, and then you're gonna be mad at Ken. <laughs> yeah, well, I was gonna say, look who's talking. Look at how your book ends. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't spoil too much. Look, but... Elle's the one that's gonna have to fix it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talk about who has the hardest job of the series. She's gonna have to take all our messes and like oh. somehow, somehow find a resolution. That will be the interesting. And clean it up. Good luck. Well, Good luck. Yeah, See ya. <laughs> yeah, we're like, it's like and, and running away and being like, See ya! I'm out of here. <laughs> She's gonna come for us, Danielle. She's gonna find oh, us. Oh yeah. She so the that. next question we have actually ties in really well to that. And it says, compared to previous books, how is the creating process different for writing the books in this? And I know we've talked a lot about collaboration, so let's kind of take that part out a little bit. But when writing a book, especially because you're either picking up and or dropping off with someone else, what was it like coming up with the writing and the story for that being like, okay, I know I have this very specific thing and specific points of entry and exit. And what was it like then having to give control away of your baby? It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of tears. There was a lot of like ups and down upsets and all of that stuff and joys because we are a unit. So it doesn't matter what I want to do. It has to be something that works for the team. Um, mm -hmm. And it has to be something that connects seamlessly to Julie's because we've set up a thing and then we spiral out from there. So it was great. And then also there were points of like, like, um, where the frame was constricting around me, I would have to say, but I think you can really create something beautiful underneath constraint. Yeah. But the, this 
was the first time I didn't get to do what I want to do all the time. I had to make concessions. And so I had to learn a lot about how I can get myself out of a box without using my usual tricks. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's well. it's tough. It's tough having expectations and this the structure that has already been delineated for us. But I found that it was it was also a great challenge too. And I think we were talking about this earlier, Danielle, where you know it's it's a challenge to connect all the dots in a way that's seamless and that feels yeah. original, mm -hmm. um, even though you're working within these constraints uh, and just you know exploring your own narrative license within that smaller space. So. I think it was fun. It was definitely harder than writing my own idea. Yeah. My own complete like you went story. From being like the one God to all of a sudden now you're in polytheism and you all have to work together and figure out how you're <laughs> so we're like the children of Zeus and Hera or whatever, whoever. Yeah. Because we don't even get to like we're like, oh, we have to ask mommy. Like, okay, <laughs> like, what, are we allowed to do this? Can we do this? <laughs> like we had and then what's yeah, and we were, everyone usually said yes. So, but we had to make it work and we had to make right. it work because whatever I do in my book and whatever Julie does in her book affects, it's like the curse, it ripples out. Exactly. And now that exactly. Julie's book is printed, like there is, I can't mess with mine. Like I, it's over. I'm like, Julie, why didn't you put that in your book? I need you to put this in your book. It's over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it is canon now. Canon. It's canon now. Get ready. <laughs> exactly. So, and I love this question. This one is one that I really like. It says, are there any particular chapters or scenes that you're very proud of or that resonated the most with you when you were writing? Julie, I can't wait to hear this. I have a favorite one from your book, but you go first. You do? You yeah. do? So I've been... I've been saying the part where Elva finds the magic mirror and it turns into a map leading her through the woods to the witch, to where the witch is now, because the mirror is connected to the witch and you'll find out how. But I also loved writing the letters between the witch and Elva's mother, and I'm not gonna go too much into it, but it's, it's really interesting to me how letters can show the reader a relationship between two people. And it's not so much telling because writing in itself is so, it's so personal. And you can see who's putting more into the relationship, how this relationship is gonna work out, how this friendship began. So I think I really enjoyed writing those letters as well. What were you going to say, Danielle? What are, what are your are really good? My my letters are very raggedy, so I'm still working on getting them. Stop! <laughs> it's stop. Your letters uh, are so good. My letters are love letters, and it's actually quite hard to write love letters. They're so good when you're in the 1920s, and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> what? Well, it's like in the 1920s, and they sort of went out of fashion with the telephone, the ad with the telephone. Yes, yeah, so I was on a struggle bus, but um, a scene that I love from Julie's book, which, okay, there is a there is a magical, well, there's a cat that I love that is so amazing because of the things that the cat can do, which you will find out. Um, and that cat is an OG. Just keep your eyes on that cat. <laughs> Because you're going to love it. agrees with you. Talking about the cat. He's agreeing. Oh, the cat. Jen. On that cat, everyone, Julie set up <laughs> this beautiful cat. And you'll see. And it's like one of my favorite things. And I know it's like such a simple thing. But if you watch what, like, it's such a beautiful relationship. And you see what happens with it. Um, I really love that. And I can't wait. I don't think I was expecting that when I read your manuscript. I screamed when I got to that part. So you guys, you guys will just have to wait. It's going to be I great. Know. And I did it for Julie because it's not <laughs> in the original outline. <laughs> I think I'm I think I texted like, you. I was like, why didn't you tell me about this? I know. I'm the one that was like, the cat. <laughs> so, and then Jen has to deal with the cat. Yes, yeah, Jen has to deal with the cat. Good luck. Good luck. That's so, uh, awesome, yeah, so the so cat is a breadcrumb per se throughout all four right. books. Keep your eyes on that cat. Um, <laughs> and um, and then other things. I just love it when in your book we get to go to the wood because mm -hmm. one, the main character, Elva, who I love, feels just more like herself and more authentic and like fully like in the way that in female spaces, women like let their guard down and, and are able to feel safe. 
you yes. really get that sense um, that Matilda provides that and that there's a beautiful camaraderie there. And I love, I love that. So those are my favorites. Whenever she goes back home or goes into the town and village, there's some tightening that happens where you see that, you know, and it, that feels really real. But yeah. seeing her like relax is good. I love that you said cat. that because there's the irony. Yes, because the I'm so North sorry. Woods. You said cat, and now I have a cat. Oh, my God. There's a cat. I can hear it. That bear. Let's see it. Sorry, he was meowing into my computer screen. Oh. <laughs> cat hair. <laughs> um, I was just saying that it's ironic that the North Woods is this dark, dangerous place, but it's where Elva and Matilda feel the most comfortable, yep. away from judgment, away from hypocrisy, away from all these people who hate them for what they are. So exactly. thank you for saying that. Mm -hmm. It's my, it's like, I loved it. I'm like, yes, we're in the wood. We're in the wood. Yes. Yeah. I would totally live there. The fairy tales have such like a powerful thing too, because it's, it's definitely an escape from society and all the pressures and societal norms that you feel. And it's interesting because I think everyone can tell during these times that social isolation, human brains don't do the best with it. But at right. the same time, there's also something very beautiful about being able to get away from the societal pressures and just mm -hmm. being able to take that guard down and not think and be yourself. So it's interesting how, totally. how both of those things, but we don't, we are not going to get to all of the questions, but I did read through all of them. And for the most part, like all of our conversation has touched on bits and pieces of it. So the last question I'm going to ask you ladies is we had someone asking about the timeline for the rest of the books. Okay. The time. Oh, the, the publication the timeline? Of the books coming out. Yes. I should have specified because timeline could mean a variety of things in this context. Timeline is in when can they read the rest of the books? Okay, so mine comes, I believe, October, next year is 2021. Yes, October 2021 is when mine is coming. And then okay. Jim, and Shattered Midnight is the title of mine, 1928 New Orleans. So good. Jen Cervantes, Fractured, it's fact, Fractured Path. Hers is July 2022, I believe. Okay, so summer. Mm-hmm, summer. Um, and then I hope I wasn't supposed to say that, but summer 2022. <laughs> and then, um, oops. and then we have L, um, L. L. McKinney is splintered, splintered something, splintered magic. Oh gosh, I should know this. I should too. <laughs> I wrote it down somewhere. Uh, but um, this is 2023. But I don't know what, I forgot what season she yeah, is. Probably so earlier in the year. year. A book each year, pretty much. Because yeah, pretty much a book a year. I think spring? originally it was supposed to be nine months each, but some of it, you know, because of COVID, things things got pushed back. But I think a book a year is going to yep. be great because it gives awesome. readers time to digest. And then, you know, when the next book comes out, they can go back and read the first one, hopefully. Or when the okay. third book comes out, they'll read the first and second. So I think it'll be good. It's It's well spaced out. Yeah, I think that's an awesome spacing for it. Exactly. Well, I I have to be the villain of this fairy tale event, for it is time in which we must now come to an end and say our goodbyes. It was such an absolute pleasure, go like Guli and Danielle, getting to hear you guys talk and just the friendship and awesome and love for this whole space. It really was a pleasure. Thank you for letting us into your world and just everything for tonight. And oh, thank you for all of the readers for attending. I thank know. Look, oh, Carrie's here. I love you, Carrie. Yes. So many friends showed up. Thank you, Mark. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry God. about the oh, anger is a gift so reference. Danielle peer pressured me into I saying did. And I planned it before in the green room beforehand. And yes, Mark, <laughs> I'm not sorry at all. We planned it. <laughs> But angry <laughs> women are a gift to society and yeah. angry change things. So I mean it works. It works. But I always know when you show up, this is what's gonna happen to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I don't think we can top that awesome that awesome reference. <laughs> We're just gonna go ahead and say goodnight to everyone. Please buy this awesome book at the buy button down below. We've also got the author's other books there as well. Have an amazing weekend, everyone. And once again, thank you so much, Julie and Danielle for going on this magical adventure with us. And we will see you next time and have a good evening.
everybody. Thank you so much, Constance, for having us. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Love you guys.